cars are at seven at stretch, and they're on their way to the British Colonial Loop. That's the bend up there. There are other names for the colorful and tricky bends and curves of this Oaksville course here at Nassau in the Bahamas, such as Blackbeard's Bend, Eckie's Twist, and Allen's Alley. This is the site of the climax of Speed Week here called the Nassau Trophy Race. I'm Dave Despain. Roger Penske is the embodiment of the successful racer businessman. His tracks and his teams are models of motorsport success. Now to trace the roots of that success, join us now in a trip back to the glory days of sports car racing, when Roger was a driver. In 1964, at the prestigious Nassau Trophy race in the Bahamas, Penske's demonstrated inability to keep his car on the road left him sidelined with a broken suspension. But even then, Roger had the Midas touch that would become his trademark. He came back and won the race. Nassau Speed Week took place at one of the most popular tourist attractions in the world, the Bahamas, Caribbean port of call for those who have grown tired of the long, cold winter. Bay Street is Nassau's shopping paradise, the West Indian equivalent of London's Bond Street, New York's Fifth Avenue, Berlin's Kerferstendam. Nassau is a duty-free port, so bargains abound on everything from straw hats to Scottish tweeds to French perfume. The port is a haven for the cruise ships that bring the tourists and home to the fishing boats that help to feed them. The warm waters of the Caribbean guarantee the tropical climate, and race fans were constantly torn between the action out at Oaks Field and here on the famous beach, where the warm breeze and soft white sand define the appeal of a tropical vacation. But no cruise ship created quite as much stir down at the dock as did the arrival of the TMT San Juan. The huge freighter carried in its hold a precious cargo, brought here but once each year at the beginning of the tourist season. The locals knew all about that cargo and couldn't wait to get a glimpse of the exotic sports cars imported for Nassau Speed Weeks and its premier event, the Nassau Trophy Race. Speed Weeks was tourist promotion, pure and simple. The objective was to get folks to the islands and get them spending money. If racing Exotica could accomplish that, then let's have a race. But that motive in no way detracted from the difficulty of the course or the quality of the competition. Let's go out to the circuit where pit reporter John Traviesco talked with one of the pre-race favorites. Well, I think I've got some real tough competition this year from Dan Gurney and Walt Hanskin, Bruce McLaren. I think it's going to be a terrific race. As you know, Nassau is a course that it really takes toll on the automobiles. And I think it, uh, it might, someone might surprise us today and win it that we never even heard of because of the mortality rate of the automobiles. I think Jim has done a great job on the chaparrales, and we feel very confident they will last. And I think if they do, we should be up there. You've already had a bit of trouble. Didn't you uh, break something and lose a wheel? Well, actually, uh, I had I hit one of the small stones out on the course, and it popped the lower ball joint out of the suspension, but this was fixed very easily. Among those hoping to challenge Roger Penske in the chaparral was American racing legend A.J. Foyt, who'd been up all night working on his Hussein One. A.J. was racing for John Meekham, who brought five cars here. Before the end of practice, he was down to two. Back then, A.J. was among a handful of drivers well known to the average American sports fan. Then, as now, the three major networks devoted most of their coverage to the stick and ball sports and only occasionally found their way to the racetracks. NBC's Jim Simpson drew the assignment of trying to make some sense out of the Nassau Trophy race. This race begins with the Le Mans start. It's tricky and the drivers practice to get it down pat. Now this is the way it works. The cars are lined up on one side of the road, the drivers are on the other. At the signal, the drivers sprint to the cars, leap in, buckle their seat belts, start the car, and away they go. You'd be surprised how quickly they can get underway, especially when you consider most of them are wearing their shoulder-type safety belts. And because of that, for this race only, the officials are permitting one member of the pit crew to help strap the driver into the car. Well, it is beginning to rain. One huge black cloud has moved from the ocean over the course. That's a shame. It wasn't supposed to rain. A lot of the drivers probably about had a chance to change to rain tires, and we could have some wicked driving conditions. It could mean there'll be a lot of slipping and sliding, and it could mean also that the more powerful cars, like Ford's Hussein, McLaren's Olds, and the Chaparrales, well, their conditions won't be exactly right. There's number 10, the car of 
Pedro Rodriguez, who is driving a four-liter Ferrari. The Ferraris, by the way, the Porsches, and some of the lighter, less powerful cars can really go in the rain. Just a few seconds now to the start, the drivers are in position. It is still raining. Not a heavy rain, but enough to put a glaze, a slippery glaze of water on the track. There's the flag. The Nassau Trophy race is underway. Hudson fighting for the lead along with the Ferrari of Rodriguez. Dan Journey and Bruce McLaren are late getting off. Pat Sharp in his chaperone Chevy number 66 is fighting for the lead with Skip Hudson and the number 94 Cooper Chevy. Pedro Rodriguez in the four liter Ferrari number 10 is running third. Number 92 Bob Johnson in the Cobra's fourth, A.J. Ford fifth, and then Penske. It's raining. It is slippery, but so far no accidents. The rain has slowed the pace, and this could wind up as the slowest first lap, by the way, in the 11-year history of the Nassau Trophy race. Take a look at that water. Hap Sharp in number 66, still out in front. Pedro Rodriguez in the number 10 Ferraris now moved into second place. Past Kip Hudson was in the Cooper Chevy number 94. Bob Johnson, number 92, and a Cobra is fourth. The pit straight. It's the end of the first lap. The leader, Hap Sharp in the Chaparral. Second, Pedro Rodriguez at Ferrari number 10 down Simonette Straight, heading for the British Colonial Loop. Rodriguez of Mexico City, a great driver in a Ferrari sports car, with a good chance to win this race if the rain keeps up. Rodriguez is just a few seconds behind Sharp, and he is challenging. The lap times are slow, but the leaders, nevertheless, as you can see as they come around the corner, are beginning to lap the slower drivers. Rodriguez is narrowing the gap. As we said, Ferraris are more steady in the rain, and that, by the way, automatic transmission on the Chaparral could be a disadvantage because it increases the wheel spin. And in this race, many of the favorites are still back in the pack. We haven't seen Roger Penske, and he was the one who made a good start. Part of the power, Cobras are doing all right. A.J. Ford and a Hussein is having problems with his powerful Dodge engine car. Hussein is the most powerful car in the race, but it's got a lot of wheel spin. When Ford applies that power, and with the slippery track, it's not good. Penske now through the pilot house corner. He's pursued by Bruce McLaren and his olds. Bruce's car number five is new, but apparently going well. Dan Gurney in a Ford-powered Lotus 19. He got a bad start, but he's moving up. There's the first wreck. It is number 64, Hugh Dibley, in a Brabham BT8 Climax, and he's out. The rain is beginning to take its toll. There's Roger Penske off the road. He apparently is out of the race. There goes Hap Sharp by him, and look at Penske. Put his thumbs up, asking him to go on. Rodriguez is pressing Sharp, though. Sharp. Let's go down to the pits and John Travieso. The early favorite Roger Penske out of the race very early. Roger, what happened? Well, it was real slippery out there, and I came around one of the corners and hit one of the small uh, corner markers, and it broke the front suspension, so it put my put me out of the race. Okay, John, but here's a development. Look at this. Number one, A.J. Ford is coming into the pits again. There's one of the world's great race drivers, and he's looking at his carburetors. The chief mechanic is uh, John Culp. This will hurt in his effort. 
starts to win this race. All drivers must make one pit stop. There's John Meekham. But uh, A.J. did not mean to make this pit stop. Sharp is making some kind of signs at the pits, and it may be that he'll be asking Roger Penske to take over for him since the rain is letting up. Here comes Dan Gurney. Hap Sharp, he's into the pits, and here comes your driver change. Remember, it has stopped raining now, and Penske can drive very well on a dry course. Sharp, who drives very well on the rain, has given up his car to it. Sharp. And of course, he's a member of the team along with Penske, and he, along with owner Jim Hall, wants very much to win this race. In a moment, we'll go back to the Bahamas, where Pedro Rodriguez Ferrari is leading, temporarily, and the pursuers include Dan Gurney and Roger Penske, now at the wheel of Half Sharp Chaparral. But first, let's join Jim Simpson for a visit to the Chaparral's home and an interesting insight into the car's creator, Jim Hall. We begin with Jim's answer to the question, why do you build race cars? You do it because uh, you enjoy it and you think you're good at it and you think you have a, a chance to uh, show your ability. I, it's not too many things that you can do in the world where you can be one of a few that build, for instance, the world's best racing car. And you consider and, this the uh, world's best racing car? Well, I don't consider it the world's best racing car right now, but I hope someday to build the world's best racing car. Now, I understand that you and Hap Sharp have quite a layout back in Midland, Texas. What is that? Well, it's, uh, it's where we build the cars, and uh, over the years, we've, it's, it's just gotten bigger and bigger. We, uh, we started out with a shop, and uh, now we've got a uh, dynamometer, test track, skid pad, uh, pretty, pretty complete facility for building this type of machine. we know these cars change race to race. We do a lot of modifications between races. The development work on the cars is continuous. So any uh, minor or major modifications are done at these same times. When the cars are put back together, all the metal parts have been checked, uh, reassembled, painted, and put back on the cars. After the cars are together, we go through what's gotten to be a pretty routine test procedure for us now. We uh, originally set the cars up on our skid pad. It's a 120-foot uh, radius circle, phase circle, that we run with the cars in both directions. And we try to balance them out where they handle the same in both directions and uh, get the lap times down to an acceptable figure. Uh, after the skid pad work's done, then we take the car out on track and make sure that it, it does uh, at different speeds what we expect it to do from the skid pad and that the brakes are working properly and the engine pulls as well as it should. And actually, a, a good lap time turned in by the car on the track uh, here has been a real good prediction for us for the rest of the tracks around the country. We find if the car is fast here, when you go to the race, it's fast there too. I'm sure you'll agree Jim Hall is about the perfect setup for building and testing racing cars. But of course, the real proof comes in the races themselves. And Jim Hall's cars have been very successful this season. In one of his own cars, Hall won the United States Road Racing Championship. Then Jim broke his arm in an accident in Canada, and so naturally, he will not be driving in the Nassau Speed Week final. Back at Nassau, and the story is this. Dan Gurney in a Lotus 19 Ford is in the lead. There he goes to the pilot house corner. Penske is close behind him in second place. McLaren is third. Lap 38, 18 more to come, and something has got to happen. Now, as we head for the finish line of the 1964 Nassau Trophy race, let me confess, I would have a terrible time calling play-by-play -play for a football or a basketball game. 
And I point that out to avoid seeming overly critical of fellow announcer Jim Simpson, who is in serious trouble as we rejoin this race. Dan Gurney's notoriously unreliable Lotus is out front. Watch closely, you're going to see Dan in a fury shaking his fist at a back marker who's been blocking his line. And all the while, Roger Penske in the white 66 is running over Dan's tailpipes, trying to pass him in a spectacular late race battle for the lead. Unfortunately, poor Jim has no idea that any of this is going on, and he gets no help from his camera crew, who missed the key pass. Here's the finish from the 1964 Nassau Trophy race. The pace is picking up considerably since the rain has disappeared from Nassau. A beautiful day now, but to the drivers more important, the track has become a lot quicker. There's Johnny, number nine. Well, Jim Hall is understandably concerned. You've heard Jim speak. Um, we understand that the Chaparral's lap times were better in practice than Gurney's, but Penske can't get ahead. He's still running second. Well, there's a long way to go for Jim Hall. Hold it. Something has happened to Gurney's car. I beg your pardon, he could be coming in for a mandatory pit stop, but apparently not, because if he were doing that, he would simply jump out of the car and jump back in. And Dan doesn't seem to be in any hurry, although his mechanics, of course, are. Dan, if you don't know, I don't know either, but something has put Dan Gurney's car out of the race. So that means that Roger Penske has gone into the lead. And there's the sign, Dan is out. Penske now has a pretty good lead over McLaren. And by the way, McLaren still has got to make his mandatory pit stop. And McLaren at number five. Penske, remember, is driving Sharp's car. And they made a pit stop when the driver switched. So they're all right. McLaren, we now find out, is 21 seconds behind Penske. too far behind. Remember, he's got that pit stop to make. Here he comes. Now the question is, is McLaren coming in or is mandatory pit stop or is there something wrong? Well, Mandatory. You saw him get out, and he's now back in and ready to go again. So that's his mandatory pit stop. But of course, that is going to increase the lead of Roger Penske. As Bruce had a little trouble getting the engine started. He's still having trouble. As he heads back for the track, Penske officially has an 88-second lead. There is Roger Penske, very close to victory. In Nassau Speed Week, Biggest race in a Chevy Chaparral, owned by Jim Hall. Yeah, still looks concerned. This race isn't over yet. Yesterday, Roger had one of the course markers and knocked suspension awry, but he is driving all right now. Moments to go before victory lap. Chaparral cars. We started out with them back in Texas. We've come to Nassau. 
and his cars have won. And despite the fact that only one finished, it's the right one. Here comes Roger Penske. His average, over 252 miles, of better than 89 miles an hour. Six miles slower than last year's winner, A.J. Foyt. Mrs. Sharp is happy. Mrs. Penske is happy, too. <laughs> Jim is reaching, or rather Roger is reaching for a little refreshment there, and there comes Hap Sharp into the picture. A great thing for Hap to do to turn over his car to Roger, but as we've said before, they were operating as a team, and they just wanted the Chaparral to win. After 252 miles, they deserve something. There's the trophy. And there is our sports and action reporter, John Travieso. We'll be back to talk to Jim Hall and to Hap Sharp and of course Roger Penske in a moment from Nassau in the Bahamas. This could be the end of a dream come true. Jim Hall, you said that you would like to have the best car in the world and that perhaps you're on your way. Today may have proven something. Well, we, uh, we sure are pleased with the result. Everything uh, looks pretty good to me. Uh, the boys did a heck of a job. It was a combination, as you know. The teamwork did it, so uh, we're pretty pleased. Well, congratulations Thank again. You. And uh, Hap Sharp, you're talking here with Roger. You're the one that started out in this car, although you're not the one that wound up. What happened? Well, uh, when I saw that Roger was out and uh, we were still in contention, I thought probably he was faster in the dry, so I came in and let him have it. And Roger, when you came in, you were a little disappointed you lost your car at first, but you came out on this one and did a fine job. Well, Jim, you know, I did a poor job at the beginning because I run it off the road and broke the suspension. And Hap, really, I saw him at the beginning. He passed me in the first turn going really well. And I, I was surprised when he brought it in, but I, I figured I'd better do the job now. Well, congratulations to both of you. And Jim Hall, it sounds to me like you've got quite a team here in these two drivers. Oh, thank you. I think so, too. And so Speed Week at Nassau in the Bahamas is ended. And so at the Nassau Trophy race in 1964, we saw a preview of Roger Penske's remarkable success in racing. He was a very good driver. By his own admission, he was not a great driver, and he subsequently hung up his helmet and put on his car owner's hat. Roger had an almost uncanny ability to put together all the pieces of the puzzle to come up with the right answer to the question, what does it take to win? From the front office to the front straightaway, he's been winning ever since, and by whatever standard you choose to apply, Roger Penske is one of the most successful graduates of the glory days of motorsports. I'm Dave Despain. Join us again for another nostalgic trip into the glory days of motorsports. Hap Sharp, he's into the pits, and here comes your driver change. Remember, it has stopped raining now, and Penske can drive very well on a dry course. Sharp, who drives very well in the rain, has given up his car to it. 